Okay, so this is Friday, uh, October 2nd, and this is ECE uh, 641 model-based image processing, and, um, and the little thing is bouncing up and down there, right? Yeah. And um, so today uh, we're going to start talking about non-Gaussian uh, mo prior models and how you use them, okay? In, um, image uh, re reconstruction, solving inverse problems. But let me show you something. Let me just skim through this. Um, uh, like from a proje projection problem point of view. So these are like the different kinds of functions you can use. Oh, OK. I guess this is about as good as you're going to do. Seems like they could come up with something better than this in this day and age, but hey. So you can have quadratic, in which case the influence function is linear. You can have absolute value, which is called total variation. Okay, why is it called total variation? Because in one dimension, if you have values like a value here, so yeah, you have a value here and a value here and then you have a value here, and then you have a value here, okay? The total variation, the cost function, right? So it's x is equal to the sum from n equals 1 to n of xn minus xn minus 1, like that. So it takes, like, the difference between this value and that value, so that's the, that's the change. Variation is another word for change, right? And then this is the change, right? And then you add that. See what I'm saying? So you understand what variation means? Total variation? So interestingly, when you have total variation, the if you have something like this, Okay, it's exactly the same cost as if you got something like this. Okay, because the only thing that matters is the total distance you traveled. So here you travel, say this is x0, this is the same value, x0. You traveled the same total distance, okay? So basically, if you have that prior model, it's going to penalize the total traveled distance. So it's a total variation, right? If you, so what would, so these are all the same. We say, okay, as long as you get from here to here, I don't care how you get there, okay? You can get there all at once, you can go smoothly, you can, whatever you want, okay? But what it won't like is if you do this. If you go, okay, because here the total variation is larger, but here the total variation is the same. So as long as the function is monotonic, getting from one point to another, it's the same amount of variation. It's as if you know, if I'm like driving someplace and I go and I stop at the rest stop, I stay an extra hour, then I go again, I drive fast, you drive slow, it's just still the same total distance, okay? Where if, if it's not total the same total distance, if, if I get lost, I make a left turn and I go back and I have to come back again. And then, you know, my wife goes, what are you doing? Pay attention, we're going backwards, okay? So that's going backwards, okay? So total variation penalizes the total distance, in some sense, traveled in 1D. In 2D, it's a little bit different because there what you're doing is you're taking the magnitude of, you take differences between neighboring pixels. There's two versions of total variation. One is generally considered better than the other, but so in total variation, uh, sort of the continuous version 
The continuous version is fine, but we never really do the continuous version because we have to discretize the problem. So the continuous thing is like this. You take the integral in 2D of the gradient's magnitude. That's the, sort of defined as the total variation. It's the analog of the total variation in 1D. But it's not exactly the same thing because it's not exactly clear. It's n there's no clear distance per se because, right? Because you're, it's 2D, right? So it's not a one-dimensional traveling problem. But it's the analog because the gradient is equivalent to the derivative. So if you integrate the absolute value of the derivative, as long as the function is monotone, the integral of the magnitude of the derivative will just give you the total change in the function. But if you take the integral of the magnitude of the derivative here, you'll get a larger quantity, right? Because you backtracked. So here's the analog in 2D, because R is integrated over 2D. Does this make sense? Do you understand that? This is a convex function because, uh, did we, t okay, you just need to read about what convex functions are, okay? Because I don't really quite have time to go into that. But a function is convex. A function is convex. So I can delete, I can delete, I can erase this. A function is convex if, a function is convex if this is a convex function. So what does that mean? It means if I take, t excuse me? That would be, uh, it's a reasonable definition, but it's not completely general. That only works when you can differentiate the, when the second derivative exists. But there's a lot of functions. That function is convex, too, and the second derivative doesn't exist here. Okay? So the more general definition, and actually the easier definition to use, is that whenever you draw a line, the line's above the function. So what does that mean? That means any, the point on the line here means that you take, um, you take, uh, so this is, this is uh, F A, and this is A, and this is B, and that's F B, right? I mean, just by definition, because this is the function F. So that point there is going to be lambda times f a plus 1 minus lambda times f b, where lambda is in the interval 0, 1, right? And that point right there, OK, so that point, that point right there is lambda a plus 1 minus lambda b, right? So what this means is that it means that lambda times f a plus 1 minus lambda times f b is uh, greater than or equal to f of lambda a plus 1 minus lambda b. And that's true for all lambda in 0, 1. That's what that picture shows. So if, it's, if, this func if this always holds, then the function's convex. If the function's continuously, uh, uh, has two continuous derivatives, so it's, it's got, its second derivative is continuously, is continuous. Its first and second derivatives are continuous. If its first derivative isn't continuous, then the second derivative doesn't even exist, okay? So if the first two derivatives are continuous, then that means that's equivalent to the second derivative being positive. But in multidimensional spaces, the second derivative isn't a, isn't a scalar, it's a matrix, right? So that means that, what does it mean to be positive? Well, it means it's a matrix, it's always a symmetric matrix, the second derivative, because the, dif you know, the partial derivative with respect to x and y is the par same as the partial derivative with respect to y and x. So you can change the order of differentiation. So the matrix is always symmetric, so it's equivalent to the matrix being positive definite. So 
a, 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 a continuously different, a, 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 a function with two continuous der derivatives is, is going to be convex if and only if its, it's, uh, it's second derivative is positive semi-definite, which means that it's non-negative definite. Its eigenvalues are greater than or equal to zero, okay? Are people familiar with the idea of convexity? Okay, so you've got, used this in other classes? Huh? Thermodynamics. Thermodynamics. Yeah, that warms my heart, okay? Gibbs Excuse me? That's a Gibbs plot. Oh, this is a Gibbs plot? Yeah. Oh, really? I didn't even know. Well, Gibbs function is a, is a convex function, right? Because e to the minus u of x, so e to the x is like, like this, is a convex function, right? So in information theory, convexity plays a very important role. Uh, it's the, res it's the um, basis of all kinds of things. We're, we're going to use it for the EM algorithm, which is, uh, it's gonna, convexity is c c critical. You know, um, entropy is sort of a convex function in some sense. Okay, because you're taking a log, right? You're taking a negative log. So the log is concave, but when you take its negative, it's convex. Okay, so this generalizes the multi-dimensions. The important thing is that if you take the sum of convex functions as convex, if you have, if f is a convex function and you take a of x, f of x, it's a convex function. If you, um, oh, a of x, okay, a of x, is a of x a convex function, a concave function, or neither? So we can say a, so y, so that function, f of x equals ax for some linear transformation a, okay? So convex, convex, concave, Okay, so is, is it convex? Is that function convex? Yes. Yes. Check. Is it concave? Yes. Yes. So it's both convex and concave. Oh, concave is just when you just reverse the inequality. Because for a linear function, it's equal. So it's both convex and concave. So that's a special case. Um, so if you add convex functions, they're convex. If, if you, uh, there's a bunch of other properties, and I'm forgetting what they are right now that are useful. Um, but uh, convexity we'll talk about a lot because when a function is convex, Oh, and then there's also a concept of strictly convex, if that's inequality is strict. Then, then they're convex, but they're, th this linear function is convex, but it's not strictly convex. So if a function's uh, convex, then um, it can't have, um, okay, if a function's strictly convex, then the, the global, the, any local minimum must be global. So that's to say that, um, uh, oh, if a function's convex, any local minimum is global. So I did, what I just said was also true. They were both true statements, but that's, the second one was more informative. So if, if, uh, if a function is convex, any local minimum must be a global minimum, but the local minimum may not be unique, okay? so. Uh, let's see. Let me sacrifice a piece of paper here. So let's say this is a function. Okay. So that function is, if like the, even if, if they're straight, the sides, or even if they're curved up, that function is convex. Right? 
So let's say they're straight, because that's a more extreme case. That's a convex function, right? The convex function may not have any global minimum. Like that doesn't have any global minimum, because the minimum goes to minus infinity. So there's no global minimum. So just because a function is convex doesn't mean have a global minimum. But if, if, the, if, the, if that edge is like, like this, right? Then, then, then any local, then any point along that edge is a local minimum. It's also a global minimum. So any local minimum is global, but it's not unique, because this function is not strictly convex. It's just convex. Even if I curve the edges, the function is convex, but it's not strictly convex because it's constant along along these. It's like a cone, right? It's constant along lines here. So uh, we'll go over that again, but it's important to keep that in mind. Convexity is really important when you're doing optimization. Basically, if a function is not convex, usually you can't find the global minimum. You can, you can find local minimum, and, and here's, you know, it used to be that, like, the thought police wouldn't let you do optimization of non-convex functions because they'd freak out. And then the reviewers would get really upset, and they'd reject your paper, and they just kind of go ballistic on you, OK? But these days, one of the great contributions of deep learning is that basically that kind of stuff is not acceptable anymore. Because um, I am pushing the button there, right? That's recording. Yeah. For some reason, I was just paranoid at that moment. That um, uh, because, like, oh come on! Like in deep learning, none of those loss functions are convex, obviously, and they do optimization, and something happens, you know. So it's sort of uh, like, you know, it's become effectively untenable to take that position. But up to even 10 years ago, I would say, you know, people would just freak out if you were trying to minimize a non-convex function. So that's obviously silly, OK? I mean, like, you know, get over it. Like, sometimes we have to optimize things, and they're not convex, OK? Like, get a, get a grip on reality, OK? But, but convexity is still really, so mo a lot of practical problems, I would almost say, OK, I don't even know what it means to be most, because I would define, require the metric on the space of problems, OK? But, but you know, it's common for you to run across non-convex optimization problems of great importance. But, uh, but nonetheless, convexity is very important, because it provides a baseline for understanding optimization. I, I would say it's a lot like Gaussian random variables. Real things are usually not Gaussian. Some are. I mean, there's some special cases where things can be very accurately modeled as Gaussian, OK? But a lot of real practical phenomena are not Gaussian. Nonetheless, Gaussian random variables are super important because they give you a baseline of understanding of the characteristics of random variables. They're sort of an important starting point, OK? OK, so, so this is total variation. OK, I went off and I talked about convexity. But there's sort of two ways of discretizing total variation, one of which is kind of not totally legitimate, but the other one is more legitimate. OK, this is what they call sometimes anisotropic total variation. So this fits completely into the framework of what we're discussing, because it it is just like a row function that you apply to pairs of pixels differences. The problem with this is that it's not isotropic. So if you do this type of a total variation, you'll get like jaggies in your reconstruction. This is what they call isotropic total variation. This, is a, this will give you a better solution so, to problems that require this sort of thing. Uh, but the optimization is pretty tricky for both of these cases. And we'll talk about that next time. So um, the things you're doing in your, in your experiment, the method that you are applying in your, in your lab won't really achieve, it will get stuck. It won't give you the solutions to this optimization problem. It won't give you a local minimum, OK? It's a convex function, 
So you actually, there will, I will present algorithms later in the, cl in the class that give you the global, will convert to the global solution is optimization problem when you have this kind of a prior. But the method you're doing in the lab won't, isn't one of them, okay? Was there a question? Uh, what, is, what is isotropic? Because I know that isotropic gaussian is one that just has like a diagonal. So the wind, I mean, isotropic is a bit of a misnomer from a technical sense in this problem. It's isotropic-ish, okay? <laughs> it's like, you know that guy on TV, he talks about things being truthy, okay? Uh, it's more truthy. It's sort of, it's truthy or something, but it's not true, okay? Okay, it's not isotropic, and here's why. Nothing is isotropic when you're processing things on a discrete grid because the discrete grid isn't isotropic. For something to be isotropic means that it doesn't have a, it doesn't have a dependency on angle. So if you, an isotropic material is a material that's, uh, material properties are not a function of angle. So you could take the material and rotate it, and its properties remain the same statistically. Obviously, you know any it's it's like stationarity, okay, but for angle. Okay. The problem is is that it's not a well-defined concept because you can't rotate an image that's discreetly sampled. You can only rotate it by 90 degrees. If it's continuous, of course, you can do an arbitrary rotation. Then you could then the concept of where isotropy is. Uh, is well defined, but in, for a discrete sense, a grid, it's a smushy idea. Okay, I mean maybe there's some papers out there that have given it a rigorous definition, but even if there are, it, it, any rigorous definition given to it is open to debate. Okay, because it, it's just not a simple concept. But the, this thing here represents the magnitude of the gradient, right? Just from a if you, if this was the derivative, okay, if this, this is a discrete approximation to a continuous derivative. If this was a derivative, then the magnitude of the gradient of f at r, right, is equal to df uh, dx, right, at position r uh, squared plus the gradient of f with respect to y squared square root, okay? So this is an analog to that. That's why they call it the isotropic gradient, okay? Then, um, I won't go into it a super huge lot. Oh, um, read this. It's got a lot of useful information that points to widely used techniques. Um, then you can also use a function, uh, we also, also commonly use functions include this to the p. The problem with um, total variation is that it will tend to generate images which, as I described last time, are like waxy or um, plasticky. So for example, if you're doing something like um, if you're doing something like medical imaging, I mean, I can tell you this is totally unacceptable. Like, don't even show it to a radiologist because they'll just freak out and they'll, have, and they'll never trust anything you ever said. Okay, okay. They, they'll just kind of, they'll, they'll just go nuts, okay? It's better just not to talk about it. They'll just get upset. So, total variation is a non-starter in applications like radiology or, um, Anything where you have to really generate a continuous image, like a natural image, it's usually not a great idea, okay? Maybe you could get away with it in some sort of consumer imaging application. The, um, if you look at some of these processed images that come out of like digital devices, like cell phones or inkjet printers or crazy things like that, they just really process the bejesus out of them. Okay, well, hold on, I was looking for a neutral term. They process the whatever out of them, okay? So um, uh, they just process them a lot. I mean, it's just really like, uh, extre it's extreme, okay? But, you know, consumers, casual consumers will often look at it and say, oh, that looks nice. 
you know, like it's the reds are really bright and the greens are really intense and they sell more device, they sell the more printers or more displays or whatever because because people sort of like that, but um, but it's not necessarily high fidelity. Okay, so uh, so you can get so you have to be careful about that. Then uh, another possibility is you can use like a power law function. These are the general, it, in the space of all things you can do, these kind of are, represent the uh, general cases. Hold on. So, yeah, sort of like the, the these are like the, um, you know, most solutions to this problem are some combination of these th cases, okay? These are sort of like the, the canonical cases, you might say, okay? I wish I could get, okay. These are like, okay, so you can use a function which is like a power law. The advantage of a power law is that you don't have any threshold. It's sort of self-symmetric, but the disadvantage is that the second derivative, if p, typically here p will be between, will be like greater than one, because then it's a convex function. Although there's been a lot of interest from the very beginning, and uh, actually Brian Jeffs, okay, the, you, the, your friend, uh, he did the case p equals less than one way early on, okay? And then there was a resurgence of interest for that case. Um, a few years, a number of years ago, the advantage of it, it when compressed sensing became popular, because the advantage of it is p less than one is non-convex, but it can draw, drive more sparsity. But usually people use p greater than one, which is convex. But the problem with that is that when p is uh, less than two, then um, the second derivative at zero becomes infinite. And that leads to some numerical instability issues. So, um, so that's a little bit tricky. Then there's this thing um, where the Huber function, where it's, it's quadratic near zero, and then it's linear over here, so that this thing's linear and then it's clips. The advantage of this is that it's smooth, the second derivative's well behaved at zero. So it's numerically stable. So it sort of gives you, um, this kind of gives you a softer version of that. And there's a lot of variations on this. And they're all, so basically anything where you make a quadratic near zero and linear far away, it's more or less a variation on this, okay? And, and there's some functions you can pick that make this, uh, can be implemented here, that make it analytically a little bit cleaner so you don't have to have this conditional thing here. But those functions like hyperbolic, you can use some hyperbolic functions or whatever. But the problem is, is that uh, you choose your poisons. Conditionals tend to be kind of nasty on GPUs and, and CPUs because they have deeply pipelined processors. So when you do conditionals, unless you're very careful, you tend to like flush the pipe. And that can be, it turns out on a lot of pros modern processors, doing a conditional is way slower than doing a multiply, okay? Like, you know, it might be like 100 times slower. But you can do conditional sometimes on processors in efficient ways if you're very careful about how you do them. You can't do them literally as a con like a decision. You do them more as, um, it's hard to explain, but, there's different ways of doing this. The reason is T here is not actually data, it's fixed, okay? So you can pre-compute the decision condition and then pipeline it. But you have to be careful. If you just do it with an if condition in C, it'll be ultra slow, okay? But, um, so you could do it with uh, like hyperbolic uh, functions. You know, like in deep learning, there's a lot of these People like to use relus. This is it's a good analogy. So a relu looks like kind of a conditional, but it's not really implemented as a conditional. It can be done very fast. And then, uh, but alternatively, you can do things like hyperbolic tangent. But uh, but they tend to be slow because they require co floating point operations that are very slow. Okay. It may not seem that important, but it's important when you're really implementing this in real applications. Okay. And then 
then you could do something like this. Uh, okay, so this hyper, this thing is basically no different than uh, than this because asymptotically, it, you know, this is just an example. Of this thing, this thing, and this are essentially no different as far as I'm concerned because this is this this is linear near zero and it reaches a limit. So it, all that's different is that you've d you've been a little more clever here, but. You've traded that off for having to do these more complex floating point operations in a processor. And then uh, you could do something like this, where you do like quadratic near zero and then a p norm far away. So that has the advantage that the second derivative is non zero here. Okay, so it's numerically more stable. It's not, you know, whatever. Or, these don't make huge differences aside from the fact that. If you use a total variation, that's that's that will create like artifacts in real images for natural applications. Okay, um, but then the other important thing to keep track of is that if you're doing total variation, so uh, okay, maybe I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but let me point make this point, which is that. So you're doing coordinate, okay, we talked about gradient descent, we talked about coordinate descent, right? So if the function is not differentiable everywhere, and the function won't be differentiable if you're using something like, um, if you're using total variation, the function's not gonna be differentiable at zero, right? That means that, and you might say, well, it's just one point, it's not differentiable. But here's the problem. When you're doing total variation, if you have a total variation, if you have an absolute value function like that, even if you add it to other functions that are quadratic, so in that case, the overall function may be strictly convex, okay? When you, okay, uh, I feel like, uh, I don't have a cell phone. I need a box. Oh. When, where's, okay, here you go. If you have like some kind of thing like this, okay, and you drop it, what's always gonna hit first? So if you have an expensive, beautiful inlaid box, okay, and you, that, you, that you paid a lot of money for, and you drop it accidentally, what happens? You what? It's gonna hit the flat side of the brain. You hit the flat side. Flat side? You hit the you, okay. I want to say you hit the edge. The edge chips. You go. Oh. <laughs> the edge chipped. Okay, right. Obviously, everybody knows that. By the way, most of what we learned in mathematics that we already knew. It's just that we're trying to express it in a different form. Okay. Whenever you drop something that has little edges, they always hit first, right? I mean, you say, but that's not fair. It could hit like completely flat. But the probability of it hitting flat is zero, okay? Both because Murphy's Law, but also because if you take a random orientation, it's likely that the edge is gonna hit. That's why you always chip the edge, right? When you drop your expensive box or something or other, okay? So, so you might say, well, it's just one point that's not differentiable. But guess what? Those are always the points that hit first. Okay? So therefore, the solution always occurs on those points. Or mostly always occurs on those points. So you can't ignore those points, even though they represent a set of measure zero. In practice, the solutions often or usually or maybe always occur on those ed edges. So you've got to be able to handle them, okay? And what happens is that, uh, and basically, if you're doing uh, LP optim, you know, a linear programming, it's not as popular as it used to be linear programming. But that's actually there's a thing called Kolmogorov's algorithm. You know, do you, does anybody teach any of that anymore? In optimization, they do linear programming. The algorithms for finding the optimal solution basically just search the vertices of polytope because you know the solution always has to fall on a vertex. Okay, it's exactly the same phenomena. Now this is what they call quadratic. Well, this is like a mixed norm uh, program because you have a quadratic and a, and a 
and L1 norm, but a similar thing happens, okay? So the problem is that if you try to use gradient descent, you can't compute the gradient at that point. Now, that said, we all use, um, with deep learning, you know, they have, it's all based on gradient descent or variations of gradient descent. There's basically preconditioning operators that, that adjust uh, the, the, the gradient value for different parts of the parameter set. So, it's, but it's essentially a variation on gradient descent. And, and that works fine, and we use relu's, okay? So all the functions in deep learning are always, are always continuous, but they're not always differentiable. The relu's in, in, in are not differentiable. They're like that, okay? So it's not differentiable at this point. Same concept, okay? So, you know, you can compute the gradients, take some sort of step, something happens, it's not perfect, but you're not exactly trying to get an exact optimization. So, you know, maybe you can't. A great coordinate descent will definitely get stuck, okay? And the reason it gets stuck is that you, you have this like crease, okay? So this is like a function which is curved, okay? But it's got a crease, just like I was showing you like this, okay? So, but that function is creased, but the crease is like bent. So there's a global minimum, there's a unique global minimum to the problem. So, but what'll happen, and I think one of the problems, I have you like cook up a problem where a gradient descent will get stuck, okay? It gets stuck in the crease. So if uh, there's like a crease like this, right? And what'll happen is that, okay, this whole thing's bowed. I'm not drawing it very well. But even though it's bowed, when you take the, when you compute the global minimum along this axis, it's there. And you compute the global minimum this way, and it's there. So you get stuck. Okay, even though, so if you have a gradient descent, mm, there's a concept of a subgradient. So um, I don't know what actually, TensorFlow does, but those things that do backpropagation, they can't compute the gradient at that point, obviously, because there is no gradient. But they do something, okay? And it kind of works. <laughs> Actually, they probably what they do is they randomize the gradient at those points. So if they compute this, there's a concept of a subgradient. So you just return some random number, okay? Associated with something that lower bounds the actual function, and it, it does something, okay? So, uh, but, so you have, this is a problem, is my basic point, okay? So, um, so, it ter so, okay, so it's a problem, but later we'll talk about a class of uh, methods which can be used to optimize those functions, okay? And that's actually chapter, um, uh, it's the chapter on constrained optimization. It turns out that there's a clever set of, pro of methods that, you know, one of the things I think that's good to come out of this class with is that obviously this obvious things you'll know, okay? I mean, like, you know, whatever, you Google it on Wikipedia and something comes up and you just do it. Okay, fine, right. So everybody can do that. I want to teach you the things everybody doesn't know, <laughs> okay? So that you have the secret sauce, okay? So a small number of people who are really into this know that there's these clever methods, okay? They're based on constraint optimization, which allow you to solve problems like this iteratively, but get the global solution, okay? So that's kind of cool because it wouldn't be, it, it's not something, well, Lee, okay, I worked on these problems for a long time, and I was like, well, I don't know how you solve these. And then somebody discovered it. Actually, it was sort of a, it's not exactly clear exactly when people discovered it because it's sort of this growing awakening uh, sometimes, you know, it sort of percolates out and people realize it applies to the world. And then, so I'd thought about it for a long time, and it never occurred to me. So it's not super obvious, at least it wasn't to me. So my point is that we're going to teach you about these clever techniques, okay, based on constraint optimization for solving optimization problems like this, that get, allow you to solve it when you have these creases. And that'll be the section on constraint optimization. 
Okay, I don't, I'm not going to get into this, but this is actually very important in practice. Scaling parameters. That if you think about these problems physically, uh, how do you, con people, mathematicians will put a parameter here and call it the regularization parameter, but that's not very effective. Usually what you want to do is do a physical scaling. So if you put a parameter here, sigma, it scales x. So this image, the question is how much regularization do you want to do? Do you want to really constrain the image a lot? Or do you want to allow it to vary quite a bit? So it's the relative weighting of the data term and the regularization term. And uh, so as sigma becomes larger, you relax the regularization. As sigma becomes smaller, you constrain it. So small sigmas give more regularization. More regularization means that the solution is smoother. Large sigmas give less regularization. Less regularization means that the image is less smooth. So that's always a trade-off you have, and it's, it, it's actually a, a, a key issue in the application of these methods, because as from, a, from an application's point of view, you've got to pick this, and there's no true correct answer as a general rule, because it depends on your application. In some applications, this is how you control the bias-variance trade-off I talked about at the very beginning. So if bias is a problem, then you're going to want to make sigma large, and be uh, sort of, you're cautious then. You're not going to, you're going to, you know, accept more noise, uh, but reduce the systematic error in your solution. So you'll have a less smooth image, but it'll be noisier. If you make sigma small, then you make the image more smooth, but uh, less noise, but you accept additional blurring. As a general rule, when you're working with students and they're first doing this stuff, they always tend to err on the side of it being over-regularized. Because they love that idea that you put a really noisy image in and it came out like looking really great. But when you work in application spaces, it tends to be the opposite. The, uh, the applications people are like, oh, don't blur my image out, OK? Give, let me, I'll, I can deal with some noise, but I don't want you to mess it up, OK? So it's sort of funny. In an so when people, academics publish papers, they love to use lots of regularization because it really impresses their friends, OK? But when you deal with people in application spaces, they're like, no, 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 no. Dial back the regularization, OK? It's like how much hot sauce you put in your barbecued beef, OK? Like, you know, if you're not a real connoisseur, you put lots of hot sauce. Like when we're going on camping trips, we put lots of hot sauce in because the food's terrible, OK? But, uh, but you know, it's fun, fine because you're hungry anyway. But, but like, you know, if I did it at home when my wife had made some, like, gourmet meat, She'd be, she'd be horrified, okay? So regularization is a little bit like hot sauce. Okay, I'm trying to give you analogies. They may be bad, but, you know, have some mercy on me, you know what I mean? So, um, okay, so the next thing we need to talk about, we're out of time, but this is chapter seven, but I just wanted to make sure I was recapping all the ideas. This is the, uh, okay, this is optimization. So the prick is, we're going to talk about mainly optimization of, of, of convex functions. So, you know, the problem here, okay, there's a lot of issues, but basically this is what I was telling you before. One of the advantages that, of the fact that I like meander a little bit in the lectures is I'm sort of covering some of the future topics to introduce, get used to them, and I kind of go back and forth. It's like painting where you sort of paint a little bit of this wall and then a little bit of that, okay? So I talked about this already, so it won't be completely unfamiliar. The idea is that most optimization algorithms involve two steps. First, it's they pick a direction, OK? They pick a direction, and then they do a line search. Then they do an update. So it's wash, rinse, repeat, OK? So in gradient descent, we pick the negative gradient as our direction. The problem when, when we were doing quadratic priors, this update was easy because we could then this function of alpha had to be quadratic. And you can always solve for the minimum of a quadratic. It's really easy. If it's not a quadratic, if it's convex, then this function will be convex. 
So you have to find some way of doing this line search efficiently. So doing the efficient line search becomes a crucial kernel of any optimization technique. So that's a lot of what we're going to talk about. Okay. So the simplest way to do a line search is uh, what we call uh, uh, okay uh, is what we call uh, um, blah 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 blah. The simplest way to do line search is um, golden section search, like this. Okay. You, you root the derivative. So rather than trying to minimize the function, you have an analytical form for the derivative, you root it, okay? So you, you try to look for a place where it goes through zero. If it's a convex function, it's just strictly monotone increasing. So you just have to look at the, find the point it passes through zero. So you do half interval search. You know, is it above this? So you check in the middle, you check halfway between A and B, you check to see if G is greater than zero or less than zero. If it's greater than zero, it must be on the right, okay? Uh, it must be on the left, okay? So you set, you set the C to B, okay, I don't know. You can go through this, okay? One thing to point out that's super important and seems unimportant, okay? I've had students who just absolutely refused to accept the importance of this until they killed two or three months trying to debug their program. Okay? This last step here is super important. It's not good enough just to return that you do this half interval search and then you would think I'll just return the last value. It's not good enough. You've got to do an interpolation. Okay? And the reason is this. If you return the last value, you've got quantization error. And that will gum up the works and everything. It's like throwing sand into a clock, OK? You say, well, the sand particles are just little things, and I blew them off. But once you throw the sand in the clock, it's going to jam everything up. Why? Because it's going to get into gears, and the gears will stop, right? The same thing happens here if you don't do this interpolation at the last step. Because when you're doing the optimization, you have a convex function. And if you don't do the interpolation, you're doing the, you have, this is your convex function. You do a discrete approximation to the convex function, right? It's like if you had a glass chalice, okay? You put sand in here, put a ball bearing. The ball bearing would just get stuck on the sand and no one go to the bottom. But if you put motor oil in here, then, this, then the thing would slow down, but it would go to the bottom, right? Quantization, nonlinear quantization effects are deadly when you're doing optimization. Even though they may be very small, the grains of sand may be very small, but they will stop the ball bearing from rolling to the bottom. So that's why this last step of doing this interpolation of the, of the values at the end is critical to floating point precision is critically important. Yeah. I guess floating point 16 is super popular and it makes all the neural networks very fast. But I feel like a floating point 16 would be like adding the sand. It is, but here's the thing. Double, floating point is fine, okay? Because you've got a huge dynamic range, okay? It's like ten, even a single precision floating point is uh, precise to about 10 to the eighth, one part in 10 to the eighth. So for the mantissa, okay? So that's fine, okay? Because one part in 10 to the eighth is pretty good. But, and also if you add some other things with the neural networks people do, so it does, which, uh, you know, basically, like I said, they randomize, they pro they've got to randomize the gradient in places like that. Then it's enough to kind of shake it around, okay? But this is like, let's say you do 10 iterations of this, of this, of this um, uh, line search, then your precision will be epsilon is equal to, to you initialize this with B minus A, right? times 2 to the minus 10. Well, 2 to the minus 10 is not that small. So 2 to the minus 10 is uh, one part in 1,000, which is 10 to the minus 3, which is way bigger than 10 to the minus 8. It's 10 to the fifth is why? 100,000. It's 100,000 times bigger than 10 to the minus 8. And one of the things that's really important when you're doing this stuff is to have a sense of the numerical precision. So it's an excellent question, by the way. OK. Please read the notes here, because I want to spend more time on some of the high-level ideas. 
And, and I just feel like if I spend a lot of time on the detailed equations, it really doesn't, it's boring. I don't really think it helps that much. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm willing to do whatever you want, okay? But I just feel it's not the best way to spend the time in class. So if you read the notes, it'll really be helpful. And here's the thing, and I said it last time, but it doesn't hurt to repeat it at least a zillion times. Read them fast, even if you feel like you don't understand it, okay? That's okay, okay? It's complicated. It takes a little while to get used to it. Read it fast, okay? But read the whole thing, because your brain will be exposed to it, okay? And even if you don't understand it all, it'll be, it's like listening to stuff in your sleep or something, it's some, okay? So you'll get the idea, and then you can read it again, okay? But read it before class, so you get the general gist, okay? Okay? And then you can also have questions. So thanks a lot. I appreciate you staying a little longer. We didn't have people in the back of the room, so I took the extra time. Bye.